On this episode, we look at foot health and walking. Then we learn about a parkway study in suburban Maryland. The organization Sustrans has created the National Cycle Network in the United Kingdom. Finally, we visit the Coalition for Smarter Growth in Washington, D.C. Stay tuned! We're in Bethesda, Maryland, talking with Glenn Gastworth, who's Executive Director of the American Podiatric Medical Association. What is the association? The American Podiatric Medical Association represents podiatrists, and podiatrists are the America's premier foot and ankle physicians. What, what does a, a foot and ankle physician do? Well, we, we diagnose and, and treat um, conditions of the foot and ankle. Uh, with regard to walking, we, we believe that we are, in fact, the experts on walking, and we provide wonderful advice and counsel to many of our patients who are looking for a way to begin what we believe to be a simple and very effective way to maintain and improve their health, and that's walking. Someone who has healthy feet, wants to go walking, what are the most important considerations? First, that they do have healthy and comfortable feet. Foot pain is not normal, so what we try to do is make sure that everyone understands that if their feet hurt, that they can see a podiatrist and begin to engage in a walking activity pretty quickly. The next most important thing is making sure that they're selecting the, the, the most correct shoes for their feet and for the walking activity. We have some wonderful tips available on our APMA website at www dot apma dot org that will provide uh, consumers with an opportunity to um, uh, get information that will be of invaluable assistance in starting a walking program including how to select the right type of shoes for their feet earlier this year you came out with your annual list of top walking cities who is number one and what they do to get there well we we're very excited that arlington virginia was ranked the number one walking city in the united states uh, we're especially thrilled about that because arlington is literally in our backyard here arlington was selected because it met um, the, some of the uh, criteria that some fourteen criteria that were looked at uh... that uh, take into consideration the habits of individuals with regard to walking fitness uh... and overall active lifestyle um, on top of that, Arlington is a wonderful community uh, with wonderful scenery and great parks and, uh, and, and makes walking just an e easy thing for people to do. Someone who was a little farther down on the list wanted to work on getting their city higher on the list next year. What sort of things should they be doing to, to make themselves a more walkable city? Well, a lot of it has to do with public attitudes. I think that if a city is really interested in making our top uh, list of, of walking cities, they have to encourage people to take advantage of walking as, as, a, as an important way to maintain and improve uh, their health of their, of their um, constituents. Um, we think, uh, and what we're trying to accomplish with our walk, Best Walking Cities program is to encourage people to walk, and we hope that cities We'll, we'll find this competition uh, a useful way to begin to get their people to begin to um, take on a more healthy lifestyle. What are some of the other things you do over the course of the year to, to bring attention to, to walking and walking for health and, and foot health? Well, we're engaged in a number of projects. Um, we have a diabetes awareness program each November that celebrates Diabetes Awareness Month. And at that point in time, we, we try to um, help guide um, many people, many people who, who don't uh, even know that they have diabetes, uh, about the importance of uh, careful inspection of their feet and recognizing that sometimes in a diabetic, uh, they may not always sense um, when something is going wrong. And we, we stress the importance of uh, regular observation and uh, regular uh, routine checks uh, with their podiatrist. Uh, during the month of April is Foot Health Awareness Month, and each year we select a topic or two uh, that we believe is important for consumers to understand about the importance of good foot health. We talk about proper footwear. We talk about uh, the important role a podiatrist can play in, in helping to uh, determine whether 
uh, a person needs an orthotic device, which is an insert that goes into the shoe to help actually control the way uh, an individual walks in dealing with some of the imbalances. Um, we try to stress over and over again the fact that foot pain is not a normal situation. Uh, and foot pain should not be ignored under any circumstances. Many times uh, simple um, prevention, preventive steps can be taken which will minimize uh, the development of uh, painful symptoms and disability or even simple disability that prevents someone from uh, living a healthy and productive lifestyle. And uh, Someone goes walking, the benefits to their health, what are the benefits for someone that walks on a regular basis? Well, we think walking is, is synonymous with wellness. Um, in this country today, we are dealing with an epidemic of obesity, uh, cardiovascular disease, diabetes. These kinds of situations can be controlled uh, very simply, um, not just with medication alone, but with the development and maintenance of a healthy lifestyle. Walking, we believe, is an important element in that healthy lifestyle. Um, obesity can be reduced uh, not only in adults but children. If they become physically active, we find that walking is just such a simple way for people to begin that physical activity. Uh, you don't have to find a fancy track. You don't have to find a fancy gym. Uh, select the right kind of shoes. Make sure your feet are feeling good. Um, and uh, select a safe uh, and appropriate uh, walking area and you've got a program that can begin very simply and effectively and results can be seen within weeks. We're in Bethesda, Maryland talking with Carolyn Wainwright who's Community Services Supervisor with the Maryland National Capital Park and Planning Commission. That's quite a mouthful. What is yes, the commission? Is. Uh, John, the commission is a bi-county agency that oversees uh, development and parks in both Montgomery and Prince George's County. And recently, the commission has been doing a, a study of some of your parkways. What's the study all about? Well, we've taken a look at uh, three parkways that are within our park system. And let me quickly define the difference between a parkway and some of your main arteries. Uh, Little Falls Parkway, Sligo Creek Parkway, Beach Drive, these are specifically designed parkways to give the experience of riding through a park, uh, riding through either on your bicycle or riding, of course, in a car. And there are different rules of the road for a parkway than there are for other streets. And one of them is how fast you're going. Uh, the other is the other kinds of things that you would encounter on a parkway, like for instance, you'd probably see a bike lane on a parkway, or you might encounter more people crossing a parkway because they're within a park and they're crossing from one side of that parkway or street to the other to get to certain facilities. So the commission has taken is taking a look at safety issues related to Sligo Creek Parkway, uh, Beach Drive, uh, which is Rock Creek, uh, along Rock Creek, and uh, Little Falls Parkway, which is where we're here now. Can I tell you a little bit about each one of the studies? Please do. What did you find out on Sligo? Well, Sligo, for instance, unfortunately, we had uh, two fatalities on Sligo that involved bicyclists. So we had to take a look at Sligo Creek Parkway in terms of is there adequate signage to let people know that there are bicyclists there? Uh, is there good striping? Uh, on the parkway to define where cars ride versus where uh, bicyclists are riding. And we also took a look at uh, just how fast people were really going. It's, it, it unfortunately has turned out to be a commuter route. And so what we've done there is put in better signage, put in some reflector arrows around some corners, Sligo Creek Parkway kind of snakes, and we've put in some speed bumps. And I think that plus some public awareness that we've done with the assistance of park police, uh, we've gotten people to sort of change their behavior. 
on uh, Beach Drive, it was an issue of uh, there's a lot of commuter bicycling going on and they aren't just staying in the bike lane. They are and have every right to use the parkway itself. And so you'll find commuter bicyclists riding three and four abreast. And uh, some motorists are feeling that's too slow and want to go around them. So what we were trying to uh, do there is educate both bicyclists and motorists as to the proper uh, speeds, which is about 25 miles an hour, and uh, good courtesy uh, so that those two conflicts uh, don't um, um, are exacerbated. Here on Little Falls Parkway, we've got another kind of issue, and that is that it is a uh, four-lane highway, two lanes on either side of a median strip in most cases, and so it is a little wider, it looks a little bit different, but here at this particular intersection, uh, there are people using the very popular Cap Capital Crescent Trail. And so when bicyclists are coming down the trail, they must stop really here to wait for traffic or to at least wait for a break. And then they can proceed across with pedestrians. We have a, um, a very heavily marked pedestrian path, but uh, cars now um, are required by law to stop when they see a pedestrian enter a pedestrian walkway. That doesn't always happen. We've had a few close calls. So far, we haven't had any fatalities, but that's another reason why we're taking a look at this intersection and other places along Little Falls to see just how safe we can make it. And we're hoping that through education and awareness of some of these issues, uh, the commission won't have to spend tax dollars to put in some remedies that will cost a little more than people just sort of stopping and obeying the law. We're talking with John Grimshaw, who's founder of Sustrans. What is Sustrans? Well, Sustrans is a charity. I think that's a not-for-profit company. And um, we have about 40,000 members. And we were set up to build practical demonstration projects to encourage people to walk and cycle. Uh, in fact, Sustrans is short for sustainable transport. So we've gone on to build um, the, the National Cycle Network in the UK, which is now uh, 10,000 miles long and um, around um, 200 million journeys were made on it last year. So it's the most, if you like, popular program in Britain that is demonstrating um, an increase in, in cycling and walking. Did you have any idea it would be that popular when you started on it? Oh, well, no, no, it doesn't start like that. Uh, we just started building a local greenway uh, in my home city of Bristol, and it was um, about 15 miles long, and we built it over about four years at weekends and things along, along an old railway formation. And it was just intensely popular. Um, you know, it was just flooded out with people. And so we said, well, this is crazy. Obviously, even in Britain, you see, the government in Britain um, believed that cycling would disappear altogether that it had no relevance in the late 20th century. So they were um, doing absolutely nothing to encourage it. And we felt it was important because it gave independence to kids, because um, it, it was clearly a, a good um, way of tra traveling around urban areas. It didn't intrude on the environment too much. And, and nowadays, of course, the whole issue of how do you reduce CO2, um, the bicycle is really a, an efficient tool for doing that. So we, yeah, we just started our first one and then we said, right, we'll build one in every single city in the country, in the west of England, yeah. where I come from. And that worked quite well. We built about 10. And then we said, right, we'll build one in every single city in Britain. And we sort of started that. It's all terribly ambitious and crazy, yes. but that's what you do when you're a voluntary group. And then we thought, right, well, we'll join them all together. And so the national network is one third of it is these greenways. And we as a charity um, own about 600 miles of greenway. And uh, so it's rather like your Rails to Trails, um, but I think the Rails to Trails organization doesn't actually own any. It's all done through the councils. In our case, it's a partnership with the councils. And um, it, it, I think the best thing of all is fixing old railways. And we go along canal paths and riversides and through parks. And we have a huge sculpture program, the largest sculpture program in Britain, because we're trying to demonstrate to the public or show to the public that really walkers and cyclists are valuable travelers and you give them the very best you know and um, so one way or the other it's just been a fun program and uh, like all these things if you keep doing it long enough you have a lot of it and so on 
But I think the real, real challenge that um, fascinates me at the moment is, is, is how do we bring about um, a willing acceptance of less travel? because um, the, the British government want to reduce uh, CO2 from transport by um, over 50% over the next few decades. And of course that can't be done on a technological basis. I understand that your president thinks it can be, but the British government feels that maybe only a third of that reduction will be on technical fixes and two thirds will have to come through personal change, social change, which means things like more people in vehicles, sharing vehicles, so that the vehicle itself goes less far but you still do the travelling. And from the cycling point of view I think we're really, really interested in can we travel less? which of course is the complete opposite of our culture. I mean, our culture is traveling more. I mean, everyone to this conference has traveled hundreds, thousands of miles to get here. Um, but I think that is going to be the challenge of our generation, of this next generation. How do we, tra how do we socially travel less? And um, if we do manage to travel less and average distances come down, then the bicycle will be part of that um, because it's, uh, it's a short distance vehicle. And I think my real question at this conference has been, are people who cycle and walk li more likely to travel less? In other words, are they already partly there in a new mindset? And because if they are, then it's not just cycling that matters, but it's the attitude of people that matters. Uh, so, for example, we know that if you don't have a car, um, you drive less. I mean, that may appear to be obvious, but it does mean that if you want to encourage people to drive less, you must have a positive program for encouraging people not to have their own car. So, for example, every housing developer um, could be required by law to um, build a shared use or include in their scheme a shared use um, facility. That could be part of the construction of a new bit of the town. Uh, and um, that is just one example. Another example would be if a citizen says, well, I don't need a car because I live near the middle of the city. I know it's not maybe the same in America, but in our cities, they're very compact. Then maybe they should be, so to speak, rewarded. I mean, I give my car up and then somebody else just parked outside the house. Uh, now, it would be much better, I said to the council, look, I am signing a contract. I'm not going to have a car. I want my pavement widened and a tree put there so that if you like we gradually reduce the space for, for traffic and we have a real problem that uh, every scheme in Britain that is there to encourage you to travel by bus of course somebody else actually drives a bit more to fill your space up and so we have to have a put in place a program to reduce traffic space so I think that's a real challenge how do we how do we travel less and I think conferences like this um, which are, are about encouraging cycling um, the, the deeper question behind which we're tackling as a charity how do you travel less in a vehicle um, how do you travel more actively because in Britain we have a huge problem of obesity um, how do you give independence to kids um, so there are a lot of sub streams going through but at the end of it all I think um, you know the bicycle which used to be seen as part of the problem uh, it was seen as a problem, it got in the way of traffic. It's actually part of the solution to the problem. That's what's so fascinating about it. We're in Washington, D.C., talking with Stuart Schwartz, who's Executive Director of the Coalition for Smarter Growth. What is the Coalition? Coalition for Smarter Growth is a network here in the D.C. region of environmental transit advocates, pedestrian advocates, supporting smarter growth, obviously, in the Washington, D.C. region, transit-oriented transit development, urban revitalization, uh, and simply a better way to grow in the D.C. region. What is transit-oriented development? It's a, a technical term, uh, but really what it's about is creating walkable communities around our transit stations, whether they be our metro rail system, a bus hub, or our commuter rail systems. Uh, that's how our initial suburbs grew in uh, America, and we're trying to re actually return to that because those communities work very well. And what uh, what worked well in them that wouldn't work in the stuff we built more recently? Uh, number one is the ability to walk, uh, something near and dear to your heart and to my heart. Uh, the uh, one of the chief advantages of development near transit is it tends to be more compact. It's usually tied to a better street grid and it creates uh, much greater walkability uh, for people. There's a better mix of uses of office and retail and housing types. Uh, many more errands are completed by walking. Uh, so very often when we look at 
the uh, transit and transit ridership, uh, we forget to f also figure out that these types of communities also generate much more walking in addition to the additional transit use. And if someone was trying to figure out, well, what's, what's your, your vision for the region, mm -hmm. where would they go to find more information? I'm glad you asked me that. They can go to two places. One is to the web or to contact us and get this CD-ROM, which is called uh, basically a blueprint for a better region. It's available on the web at betterregion.org. It's a side website that we have at the Coalition for Smarter Growth simply to have this presentation up. It's narrated. Uh, you can click through the presentation and get a basic description of a vision for the Washington, D.C. region, very much tied to our metro rail and our commuter rail system. And how does your vision differ from what's actually being done, the priorities that the region actually displays at the moment? Well, our region does better than most regions of the country uh, in terms of investing in transit. Uh, we can also thank the country for its federal tax dollars that help build the metro rail system. However, there are two competing visions for how our region can grow. Uh, one is our vision of, of, more, of a more compact development pattern, greater walkability, uh, and transit-oriented development. The other has been this, has been this push uh, by some developers, not all, some members of the business community, not all, for outer beltways around the region, and a continuation of the scattered development patterns known as sprawl that we have around this region. And like other regions, we still have plenty, we have plenty of sprawl. Uh, that's the scattered development where you have no choice but to drive for every trip. The outer beltway would sit anywhere from 15 to 25 miles beyond the core of the region. Uh, and certainly, in our view, increase sprawl development, increase traffic, and certainly reduce walkability for people. And talking about investments, uh, one of the great concerns uh, that we have is that Virginia in particular has never invested enough in our transit systems in this region. A lot of the burden is put on our local governments uh, by the state in Virginia, and we're worried about shifts in Maryland, um, given the push for an outer beltway segment called the Intercounty Connector, uh, that they will shift more money away from transit in favor of building this highway. In terms of walkability, uh, both bicycle and pedestrian modes get the smallest proportion of any of the transportation budgets in, in both states. The recent report, Mean Streets, by the Surface Transportation Policy Project showed that less than half a percent of the budgets of Maryland and Virginia are being spent on pedestrian safety, pedestrian facilities. Uh, uh, and this is in spite of the fact that the same report showed that 17 percent of fatalities and in, in accidents have been pedestrians. Uh, so 17 percent of the safety problem and, and, and bearing the brunt of the, uh, the lack of safety on our roadways are pedestrians, but less than half a percent of the state budgets are going to funding this need. And how can the members of your coalition or, or someone that's, that's seen your report, what can they do to, to further that vision to, to help shift the priorities? We're doing, we're doing a lot of things. Uh, we have a General Assembly session coming up in both Maryland and Virginia. There will be transportation funding debates. It's going to be important to be in that debate and let, have, let your legislators know that you want a much higher priority to be placed on spending for pedestrians and bicyclists, much higher priority to be spent on transit, and even supporting a much higher priority on spending on secondary roads, local roads. Uh, in effect, most of our transportation spending is backwards in terms of smart growth or pedestrian friendliness. In Virginia, uh, even given the good reforms of the current administration, there is still a shift in uh, funding towards interstates and uh, reducing the funding for even secondary roads, putting the burden on local governments. That's exactly backwards of what you want to do. If you want to create walkable communities with less traffic, you need to be investing in the secondary street grid, not just the sidewalks, but give, give us a good fabric of secondary streets that we can put the sidewalks next to um, and to make them more pedestrian friendly. So that's the first thing, transportation funding, where the priorities are being set in the two states. Uh, the uh, other things we're going to try to achieve uh, at the state level, both throughout through the General Assembly sessions and beyond, are... Uh, better linking of land use and transportation spending and planning, significantly supporting more transit-oriented development, interconnecting Commonwealth of Virginia. In particular, we have a project called Reconnecting Virginia uh, between rail 
and development near transit, which should also help us improve uh, the number of walkable communities we have in the state of Virginia. And then the th last piece I would say is work locally. Um, while we talk regionally about this vision, it's all about creating more walkable communities at the local level. Uh, we think one of the best tools for this are architectural design charrettes, uh, new urbanism as a concept uh, from the architecture community talks about creating more walkable communities and using a public process to do that. Uh, these can be used for a transit station area like uh, or a future transit station area. Key places in Virginia we'd like to see this done would be Tyson's Corner or the Route 1 corridor. The Route 1 corridor in Maryland I think has had some. We could do some more work uh, on that as well as the metro stations in Montgomery and Prince George's County. Rockville Pike would be another great place. Uh, clearly we have an idea of what these visions should be and usually the public uh, when they go through this process say the same thing. Uh, they want more compact development, they want places that look much more like traditional towns and cities where the buildings are built up closer to the street, roads are narrower, uh, there's uh, much more pedestrian friendliness to these communities. Uh, and so we would ask folks to work locally, get their elected officials and planners to support these design charrettes, and then to actually implement them, that these not be plans that sit on a shelf. Uh, in that regard, I think the best model that we've seen recently has been in Arlington on Columbia Pike. Uh, they did a architectural design charrette process. By, it was done by Dover Cole Architects. They then took this community vision, which was your, you know, it's your standard Main Street vision for a community, a, a real true Main Street. And what they did was uh, incorporated that vision into a design code. They actually wrote a zoning code based upon design, um, building heights, building setbacks, width of sidewalks, lots of pedestrian friendly elements into this. And they made this design, this a part of their zoning ordinance as an option that developers could build to. To incentivize the developers, one of the things they did is they would give them 30-day streamlined approval, no public hearings, if they would build right to the citizen approved plan. And so that, we think, is a key way at the local level to create walkable communities. Visit us on the internet at www.pedestrians.org.